So, hi everybody. Welcome to this really amazing opportunity to talk to um, the artist Lund and known as Lund and Saitel. Um, my name is Phelan O'Halon uh, and I'm a theatre maker and producer based in Galway. Uh, this opportunity has been created through the Interaction Project, which is taking place in Galway uh, this week and the week following. Interaction looks to look at the connections between technology and theatre making. Uh, and, and gives artists supports to create new work in this dimension. Uh, as part of that series, as part of the Galway 2020 uh, European Capital of Culture project, uh, we, I have had the great opportunity to reach out to these amazing artists that you see before you. And today we're going to talk about their work and uh, we're going to talk about their latest uh, app for home settings. So I'll give a quick introduction to them. Um, Founded in 2003, the pair met earlier than this, obviously, in 2001, uh, and composed with visual artist and curator Krista Lundell and, and Martina Seitel. Uh, they are known as Lundell and Seitel and are based in Stockholm, but were based in, in London for some time also. Uh, they came to the public's attention with their installations in museums and theatres, interrogating the idea of a museum itself uh, in an age of online information. Uh, their work has been presented internationally in museums, galleries, science fairs, uh, festivals and public spaces. Uh, they explore history, time, space and human perception, organizing spectators in immersion and their participation in the universe removed from reality. Uh, strongly rooted in research and choreography, uh, they use a participatory style of performance, often conceived in collaboration with other disciplines. Uh, they've presented internationally all over the world. Uh, and some examples of this include the Koshi Murzis uh, Biennale of Contemporary Art in India in 2017, and the Royal Academy of London in 2014 in collaboration with the Lyft Festival. And they have recently been, been awarded, not only nominated, but awarded for the prestigious Sven Harvey's Art Museum Scholarship, uh, which the guys will tell me more about in a moment. So yeah, without further ado, I introduce Krista and Martina. Hi guys, how are you doing? Hey. Hey. <laughs> yes, it's great, I think. Yeah. Is that good? Close enough? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. You mean you mean the summary of us, our lives? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then this is the this is the, the awkward part where I say, could you tell me a little bit about yourselves? Uh, <laughs> could you tell me about where you're from and uh, and even how you started working together? All right. Uh, so uh, we are both actually born uh, in the same quite small young shopping, but we didn't know, meet each other until we paradox paradoxically until we moved abroad and then came back for the summer. Then we first met. And I was studying choreography then at London, uh, Laban Centre. Uh, and you were studying, I think, in, Firenze, in Florence, in Italy. Like. Yeah. And so we kind of, I mean, I was more of a, tra not a traditional choreographer, but I was making stage pieces and Krista was making paintings. So our mediums were very different. But then somehow we seemed to have created from the same core or we had a very similar driving force and areas of interest. So kind of naturally without planning it, um, and also when we lived in Prague, I think together, we started to somehow be part of each other's works, even though we still worked separately. And then eventually when we moved back to London, or, uh, or when you moved to London, I moved back to London, I studied my master's degree at Middlesex University in choreography and you at St. St. Martin's and I was uh, more fine art, so it was, um... Uh, at, the, at the time, it was interesting how we synced there because, Martin, as you're saying, you were having your stage choreography, exploring a really deep uh, processes with your dancers, and you felt somewhat a bit uh, not exactly that because they went through a very deep process, yes. and 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 when you were then going to present their process as a material for for movement on stage, you felt that it was never really reached as deep as you could do with them. Yeah. So in a way... We had an from, incredible from, process, from, actually. Yeah, it's from your perspective, weird. you made the, 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 the audience, um, in a way, the dancers, when you switched to the work that we created, yeah. right? Exactly, that was to me, that, that was what happened, because I think the dancers, I worked with them for a month, and they went through these incredible journeys, 
and it, it was no drugs and anything involved, but it was as if we'd been taken by a, a strong force of imagination. And we, we, it was almost, and, and I felt the yeah, enemy. And then this was going to be presented on stage, a 15 minutes piece of choreography, which was interesting, but I still I felt there's something missing. Like, what, why are we looking at this? Why having such a long cross? And then we end up with 15 minutes and we sit and look at, seated and looking at it. So that yeah. was like you said, Krista, that when we... Yeah, it doesn't make sense. I mean, also yeah. for me, because of course, I'm not from the stage uh, choreography world. I'm not from the visual... Uh, I'm from the visual arts yes. where I am used to work in a studio, uh, creating um, sort of um, art pieces, object-based art installations, but also digital works and so on, <clears throat> that then are lifted out from the studio into a, a gallery and they are uh, looked at or sort of engaged by, by the visitors of a gallery or a museum, and then in a sort of social setting, sort of uh, taken in and, 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 and uh, also, of course, social, the social thing around the gallery and the visual arts is very important, of course, the discussions around it, the sharing of ideas and so on. But then as an artist, I felt that I, uh, the same, in the same way as Martina went through a very deep process where I felt extremely immersed in the artwork whilst doing it, I felt I totally lost that when I actually like, you know, put it out into, for viewing in a, in a gallery or so. So uh, when I was in my master uh, in, in St. St. Martins, I was, uh, became a curator for a short while there, being an artist, because I wanted to look at the, the, the process of looking at art itself as being an, an artwork. Mm -hmm. So I made an exhibition that I called Knee Jerk, which was this sort of direct response that you have when the doctors hit your knee and the, and the knee goes directly, that reaction goes mm -hmm. bypassing the brain directly to you. It's like really physical encounter. Mm -hmm. So I, I uh, wanted artists to create artworks which were not object-based, but was dealing with uh, direct physical experience rather. Uh, and, I, and I got 20 artists, some of them from the University of the Arts and some of them from like mid-career artists wanting to be part of this because they thought it was interesting. Um, um, and for this first exhibition yeah. that I ever curated, um, me and Martina also made an artwork of our own that we submitted. I think I created, I wanted to create the own context, I wanted to create that context that actually the artworks that we envisioned could, that needed a context and that's I think what I created with the oh, exhibition. Because the artworks and, we, and we have, this have been followers already since we started, that there was no context for our work. We always felt a bit alienated from the different disciplines. We, and always... we still do. <laughs> we still do. But I guess that was the first time we ever kind of had more, instead of just being inspired by each other, this was kind of actually where we merged our practices and we became more truly transdisciplinary because you couldn't no longer tell, like separate the Martina from the Christa parts. They were kind of, they became more one. Mm -hmm. And we had no idea uh, of the reactions and we were not prepared at all that the reactions were so strong. So that was really, I remember that night and so when we exhibited for the first time, mm. we, we were very shocked that people were reacting so strongly to the work. And that was mm. kind of the pre, kind of, the pre-work, the very early versions of the interactive works that we're to, doing today. Mm. Yeah, I mean, mm. it's interesting you say even with, do you still struggle with the form that you're, you're dealing with? Because, it, you know, I came into your work from, an, uh, you know, looking into immersive theatre but it's so, it's so, it, it, it can't, I don't think it, it lies in that realm either. You know, it lies in a, in a, in a, in a multiple of realms. So like, I guess it's, it's interesting about form and how you, mm. you come to mm. develop and never mm. really end developing what, what form you're working in, I suppose. Mm. Mm, um, I guess, you know, for Irish audiences that may not have, maybe not have gotten a chance to experience your work yet, uh, as far as I know, I think maybe maybe presented in in Belfast, but maybe not in the in the Republic yet. I mean, how would you maybe describe the kind of driving force of your work for 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 someone who's never seen it? Yes. Or experienced it, I should say. Yeah. I think it's important to remember that um, uh, maybe I can start by describing a situation, uh, and that would help you maybe to imagine it a little bit. But the situation is that when we have meetings with people. Uh, where we're presenting our work to be 
go into your office, for example, and we are we're about to present our work, we actually bring our portable kit of Symphony of a Missing Room. So we bring the headphones, two MP3 players, and the white out goggles. <laughs> because it's really difficult to you, you can describe it uh, but it's nothing compared to the actual experience because we work so much pre with pre-verbal states of mind and body that it doesn't make sense in the same way when it's being described so that's that's what we do in the meeting so that's the first thing we do and then we talk and um, so that's just kind of giving you a little bit of the situation we're in uh, but if to kind of break down a little bit the different elements we're using, so we're using sound, normally three-dimensional sound, and that is often being played out in headphones. We're often working with the senses, so, and that means kind of depriving the visitor. The visitor is someone that enters the work. They have to kind of reinvent the term for that. And, uh, and so they wear like a blindfold where they, for example, only can perceive light or shadow. And then sometimes the work is in total darkness as well. And it's normally uh, immersive in some sense, so you're kind of being immersed, but it also happens if the main stage for the work is with the inside the visitor themselves. So you have to, it, it's nothing in itself, you as the visitor would have to complete the work. And we also move a lot between different contexts. So we are theater choreography, visual arts, even film documentary late, lately we've been part of. And we also kind of are interested in technology so for example we've been doing virtual reality pieces or we've been making apps but i would have to really stress that the technology isn't the center of the work itself it's always the human aspect and the human aspect brings us to the next thing which is the touch for example we often use the sense of touch with another person uh, and that's a, the choreographic aspect i guess to it there you be choreograph the touch yeah, it's, it's a really, it's, I mean, most of the time, I mean, for example, when we started out making our work, we didn't have, we had this really, we had a, a, not even MP3 players, we had the CD, CD, portable CD players playing the actual oh uh, files or sound <laughs> files that we created. Um, and um, Do you keep yeah, yes. this is a bit later, but still it's very, this is MP3 players um, that they listen to in the sound. So the, in, the sound is recorded with a really good binaural dummy head from, from Neumann and Sennheiser. So the sound quality is extremely good. But then again, that's the, that's the furthest that the high tech goes. Uh, then it's just normal sound editing. And it's very linear, but it's experienced as being not non-linear because we give it a sense that you have a choice inside the piece or that things are feeling very live. So the, the recording that you, you hear and you pass through uh, different ac ac acoustic spaces, because the synchronized touch from the performer is uh, acting together with the sound, it, it, the, the, the voice might say things like, I'm, I'm standing in front of you, my hand is here, and then they will feel a touch of the hand. Uh, and this multisensory stimulation, putting all of these senses together, and then also leaving some senses out, created one coherent experience, which is the sort of now feeling of, of being here and now in this uh, um, virtual, yet physical space. I think so about it this because this is a, your program here is called interaction. And I think the, the, the term interaction is, for me at least, sometimes I don't mean interaction being what you normally see in science museum. You pull something and something happens. Or you, are, you can decide this or that. I think the decision side of the human consciousness is not activated in our work but the experience side of the human consciousness is 100% is activated. So normally in daily life, there's so much of your consciousness which is taking to go from A to B and take decisions, how you're pushing your life further. Um, and of course, in one way, I mean, technology is sort of, sort of helping us to do that now, which is a bit uh, maybe not sort of helpful all the time, but, but uh, I think in our work somehow the part of us which is there to, ex that, um, to experience and to really like to be able to be fully there, to be present in, in my experience uh, is giving space. Um, I mean, talking about technology, 
and, and the technologies that you do use mix between quite lo-fi and in, in some cases very very high tech uh, you know mm. you're kind of with with some of the elements of work that you're doing with uh, eternal return and new mm. work coming out and that has that has been out already actually uh, mm. looking at vr and all these types of technologies i mean two questions about that i suppose i mean using technology in a public space realm i mean these kind of bring ideas of of, of kind of a shared experience um, and particularly like I'll, I'll mention another project which is unknown clouds as well uh, where you use technology in a really simple way to bring people together and that they could have a shared idea um, and a shared vision of something i think that mm -hmm. maybe in theater making that's going towards this direction of, of, of using technology. People are afraid it's very uh, singular. It's a solo experience and not a shared one, you know. Mm -hmm. um, do you think you could tell me a little bit about Unknown Cloud uh, and, and just maybe the idea of, of this kind of using technology to create a shared experience? I think it started with um, uh, the frustration with uh, what a device can do to us. Because, I mean, first of all, it's extremely like ocular. You know, you and you also it can be extremely distractive and also isolating as well. I mean, you or you, for example, through Facebook, you connect, but it, it gives you an, an illusion of you connecting with someone. It's almost like a drug, but you don't really get any resonance. I mean, you get perhaps likes, but that's not, I would say, that's a fake sense of resonance. So, um, what we wanted to do is to kind of bring people together into the same public space and into a group and into a shared experience. So the inspiration was like, for example, if there's a, you know, when there's an astronomical event, like a solar eclipse or a Venus passage, people kind of try to catch it. So suddenly you see your neighbor and you meet and, and, and with the universe, it's, you don't really, it doesn't really wait for you. You know, I mean, if you're late for the Venus passage, you're gonna have to wait another, maybe, I don't know, 100 years. So I, I don't know how many years between, uh, there are between them. So it doesn't wait for you. So we wanted to create an app. Yeah, that's exactly, that's uh, an image from Tempelhof I felt in, uh, in Berlin, Berlin Festspiele, where we had the app. So it, people are brought together with the mythology of a cloud. So there's an unknown cloud that cannot be seen with your, uh, perceived with your senses but that uh, if you download the app called Caretaker, it will actually translate the signals from the cloud and you'll be able to hear things you normally cannot hear. But in order to do so, the mythology says that you need, you need to come together as the cloud is passing your geographical location, which you can see on, an, on a map um, and when it's coming. And if you come together, the more people you are, the more chances you have to kind of bring the cloud towards you and then as you do as you succeed kind of bringing in the cloud you start to hear through it it becomes like a giant amplifier so you'll be able to you start to be able to hear first like the radio astronomical sound of the sun which has been this sounds has been collected through nasa and you hear for example a storm on venus or you hear uh, and then eventually you start to hear the collision of two black holes that happened uh, around the time when the first plants emerge on earth and but then you start to hear things that are nearer as well so you might hear other people participating participating inside the cloud in a different location so the uh, on the earth yeah, so you're giving yeah. a real sense of presence mm -hmm. and then a sort of shared um, uh, uh, time together and, and also like uh, you also like maybe feel like if you're looking up to, the, to uh, uh, listen to the planet in, 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 in far away, um, I don't know how many kilometers up in, in the space in that direction. And if you know that someone else does that in, in India, you sort of like not look, I'm not looking at India from a perspective here on earth, which is quite a, like modeled by a lot of like uh, news images from India. Or political, or political views and so on. But you're standing side by side, looking at something that is external to us somewhere else, even not on earth. So there's a different sort of perspective, I think, what we wanted to do. To yeah, do. it resembles a little bit the experience that astronauts have imported when earth gazing from the ISS. Okay. So, uh, so it's more uh, like about that. But it's also kind of, I guess, like a lot. I mean, now when we're talking, I don't know how it feels to be in your space. I mean, I can see like the wooden structure, but it's different. I think when the eyes are sometimes, the vision is sometimes pushing us away from a space so when you close your eyes and listen and you and you move inside a space it might give you a stronger sense of 
how it really feels like to be in that location uh, even though you're not physically there so it's kind of yeah it's, it's a real struggle for right now. um i want to kind of move towards symphony of a missing room and 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 this this you know this new app for you know the current isolation that we find ourselves in um uh as, as i know that we'll be we'll be I guess promoting the, the the app, which is now available on 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 Apple Store and and, and on and Android as well. Um, but I think just to give a little context to it, I, I wonder if you could explain maybe a little bit about Symphony of Missing Room itself uh, and how the project's developed. It's been in development for about 10, 10 years, and this is uh, yeah. this is the new uh, adaptation to it to the to the to the times we're in right. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I mean, uh, Symphony of a Missing Room it started out 2009 in the National Museum in Stockholm. It was produced by Veld, uh, a local sort of multidisciplinary platform here. Um, and yeah, it started there. Uh, it was really at that time a uh, work looking at the museum as a phenomenon, uh, a bit uh, similar to what we described in the beginning of this uh, Zoom, Zoom session. Uh, that we're looking at uh, the, the sort of structures around a visit to the museum and the structures around how you're looking at art and the way how you take art in. Um, uh, and then making that sort of whole choreography uh, an artwork in itself. Um, and it was six visitors entering a museum. Uh, eventually they got headphones on. Um, and eventually they even got also sightless goggles on, which taking away the physical museum. Uh, away, it it um, it it, it um, and when they have got the sightless goggles on, they have already, of course, uh, been to the museum. They have sort of taken some snapshots with their consciousness about where they are, what situation they are in, and then they are brought away from that with the goggles. Uh, and then these guides that we talked about before uh, are leading you through this virtual uh, parallel space, which is sort of. Um, uh, uh, like uh, the voice says that you're entering a space which uh, is a big white space uh, and because you don't see anything it is of course white <laughs> and you're having a very uh, binary three-dimensional sound in your ears about entering that space and, and you are, you are, this place is said to have never exhibited any artworks um, and somewhat you entering this space as a visitor and you sort of realizing that you are the one projecting into whatever is going to be in that uh, space. So your imagination, your memory is really what creates the world. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how you, how you, how did you go in from going from a public element into something that actually people, people can use at home and not, you know, not even people that might be regular gallery goers or, or theater goers um, it's it's an app that can be downloaded i'm, I'm going to show some slides now of some some pictures from uh, people using the app in their in their home into art or theater to see the world i really would like to reach out to a lot of different people that normally don't experience art and that's always kind of been an important aspect to it but then another thing is that uh, if we speak about the guide, the guide is the person that guides you in the original Symphony of a Missing Room, but suddenly that guide turns into your family member. So it's from the guide being maybe in person or you don't know who's guiding you, you, don't, you will never meet them again, you don't know who they were. Suddenly it might be your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your partner. Um, and uh, you have this experience together where you don't talk to each other, but you listen to instruction and one guides the other and then you swap. So you're kind of responsible for each other. And you have to be caring uh, and you share this experience together. And it somehow gives a totally different uh, meaning to each couple or each per. I mean, as duo, each doing this work. Mm. Um, I would say it's the main difference. Yeah, it's yeah. sort of, I think what one thing that maybe art always has done to, to some extent is that it can change the, how you perceive the reality around you. So I think what this piece does is that it's maybe, it uses the phone differently. The phone is no longer something that you, the screen is not the main thing, but you're actually using the screen as a sort of light source that 
shines up through the other person's um, eye, eyes. So like this, so you, Christy closes his eyes. And, and I have binaural see. sound that correspond to that at the same time as the person leading me and, and, and th uh, leading me through this virtual space. That it becomes I, the torch, basically. So, yeah, exactly. And, and um, I think it, it has the potential to, I mean, uh, when you take, when you go out of this experience, 15 minutes or so, you are going to feel your uh, home location quite differently. And you may be able, for at least for some brief uh, moments, you will even feel a bit estranged to your, the person that you have done it with, even though this person is your partner. The P, and if you go back to the image there of the, <laughs> Uh, the, yeah, this is from the Lower in 1942, the one before. The next one, I think. The, with the, the empty with the frames. frames. Yeah, with the frames there. Uh, and that image, this yeah, yeah, this one, yeah. It was basically, uh, it was part of a, the exhibition that we did with Symphony in Centre Pompidou Metz. Mm -hmm. And it's showing the image of 1942 in Lower when the artworks were taken away from the museum to be saved for potential bombings. Um, and it, we like this image a lot. Uh, because mm -hmm. it sort of gives us an absence of art, yet a very strong presence of art because you, in a way, like maybe it's in, in, in a way how the, like the, 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 the isolation that you have from COVID-19 now, what it does to us is when art is not accessible, we feel it's a lot stronger inside us, everyone. And I think it's this kind of force of art and the, the, uh, the need for connecting through art with other people uh, that uh, we wanted to bring bring out with this the symphony 2020 uh, um, and, and, yeah. and and because of it has this because it has this uh, in its own history mm. it was so natural to do it i think and i think with the covid-19 situation i think it really makes us gives us the need to understand what does art and theater and culture, what does that mean to us? And really kind of coming to its essence, what does it really do? And it doesn't have to be even tangible what it does, you know, it might be something that's beyond words or, or it might be something including words too. But so I'm, I think it's interesting that it really kind of, I think we are forced to understand the answer to that question And in the West, they're looking at these different, uh, I guess, avenues of their work. You know, do we go into a realm of VR, then, or mixed reality, or you know, mm -hmm. looking into then this, you know, the 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 great use of binaural recordings that you guys can use in terms of bringing you into a, almost your own imagination, not you know, architect mm -hmm. by yourselves, but. Do you think particularly with VR, and I know you've had collaborations with, with Scan Labs and, and with Eternal Return, I mean, what do you think is, is the future in terms of using that as a medium? I mean, for you, I feel like that it's, it, it's used as a device to get your message as opposed to the, you know, exploring the, the realm. Yeah, of yeah, no, exactly. And I think that's, it's like not, I mean, the, the, the general idea would be that uh, augmented reality, that's the, where we should go rather than VR, because VR is... But of course, then it means what you mean by it. I mean, if you mean virtual reality in terms of that, that's a space that you produce only yourself, where you know, have no touching about your surrounding. Of course, that's not a good way to go. Then augment the idea of augmented reality is better. But then again, what is augmented reality? I mean, augmented reality always talked about this is idea that you sort of project sort of like a, sort of like a, a holographic space onto your physical space visually. But of course, like in Eternal Return, uh, the piece that we created with ScanLab projects, there you, for example, have VR goggles, but you have also uh, a physical space that is corresponding to the virtual space that you see. Uh, and there is, uh, so you, you touch uh, a working bench in Steinway & Sons uh, workshop, piano workshop in London, and you also touch, uh, you see it and you touch it and there you can feel it there. And it, the, the, the two sensory modal modalities is corresponding. But then at one point you sort of to take up a hammer, but you don't feel a hammer, but it's the imprint of the hammer because the hammer was there once, but it's not there any longer. It's more the friction and it's the poetry friction and the philosophy it. of how the virtual and the physical interact and are in friction with each other. So we are not interested in that like complete immersive experiences, but it's rather how the physical and the virtual talk to each other through you as human body moving mm -hmm, through mm -hmm, that space. Mm -hmm. And that absolutely, because anyway, like when we speak about phenomenon as um, like the philosopher Thomas Metzinger speaks about out of body experiences, how that is potential, like you are going into your, 
it's almost like going into the stage set of your life but from an external viewpoint or when you're dreaming basically you're just the body lying in a bed simultaneously so kind of how we exist in and we don't know of course what reality is but the production of reality is exactly anyway so we're more that's why we're more interested in the friction between but i think hmm. i mean i'm thinking about our son he's uh, he's five and he has this natural augmented reality. So when we go to nursery, he's kind of, there's a rail track there, don't go there. And he see it's exact, like, I can't see it, but, <laughs> and there's no technology used. So there's something, but then I'm wondering, that I think that in order to, I'm not so interested in like, maybe what's the future of something, but I'm also really interested in, understand, I think we first really need to understand what it means with technology and what it, what it doesn't have. Like, what is it? And maybe we understand that a little bit through COVID-19, like what aspects, if the technology takes over your mm -hmm. imagination totally, what if future generations can't mm -hmm. have the same imaginative capacity? You know, like just yeah. reading a book, it, it really gives you a particular like sense of virtual reality, sense of space that you re-enter next time exactly the same when you re-enter that book. Yeah. After it, yeah. so this, yeah, I'm I mean, thinking also the technology is normal, like now when we're sitting on Zoom again, like, we think we see our front sides and you know it's two dimensional but i think more and more we tend to forget that our bodies are three dimensional so like how can we just when we close up our eyes we become aware of our backside of the body and very more like you know when you're being like walking alone in the night from a bus stop you kind of become really aware of your backside that's one of the few moments these days and i think it's kind of um, for me, it's about re-remembering about these aspects of the, the body and uh, the mind, the soul, the spirit, all these kind of holistic aspects. And then how do, that, can that coexist with technology without one cancelling out the other? I don't think that, you know, we know technology at all. No, it's kind of how can they coexist in a way they support each other rather than working against each other or cancelling each other out. And that's why I think it's important with the practices that are not kind of maybe money driven that we think that's a little bit of a trap if we would think about like what would, what choices would make most money, I think would make different choices than mm -hmm. if we're driven by curiosity. Um, yeah. Mm. That's, a good, that's a good note maybe to finish on. I have to be driven by curiosity. <laughs> yes. Driven by curiosity. You can definitely try out uh, the fantastic new app at home, uh, a symphony for missing room at home. And you can find, get on the app store and in the Google play. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. It's on both yeah. platforms yeah. now. Um, it is it, free as well. It is things. free, yeah. And it's, it's, um, I think it works about uh, like 90% of different phones, but uh, uh, we, we are hoping to make it even more, um, to, to, uh, to make it so that more people can experience it. Absolutely, and we're kind of constantly working with DVA now on kind of stabilizing everything. So it's kind of, um, it will have, I mean, it doesn't go away, the artwork. It's not limited to, play period it you will know, keep evolving as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah for a long time guys um i want to say thank you so much it's been great to chat to you and to talk to you about your work and yeah i just I'm, I, I really hope that people who are watching this can can try out the app it's it's a really amazing and immersive kind of experience in its own its own right and and also the other massive catalog of work that you that you guys have and uh I hope that we can see you in Ireland in the physical. Yeah. Yes, we want to come. <laughs> uh, this is made as a, as a project thanks to Galway 2020. So thank you very much for uh, making this happen. And, and for the interaction project, uh, interactiongalway.com. Uh, you'll find a timetable of scratch scripts and new development projects uh, during the next two weeks. Uh, Memory lies included, a development piece that I'm working on which is a headset piece as well. So um, really thanks to that. And thanks to Studio Kuhn for me for putting this uh, on. And I know the, the, the music. Can you tell us a little bit about the award that you got recently as well? I know <laughs> Emma. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you guys would have mentioned that you're too humble. <laughs> We've actually been knowing about it uh, since Christmas time. When, uh, so, but we had to keep it secret for a long time hmm. uh, until now. Yeah, uh, it yeah was, it's, a, it's, a, great. It's, it's great because yeah. it's also, I mean, it's a reward. Um, it's like a stipend in in contemporary art. There is a museum here in Stockholm called Sven Harris Museum, and it was a jury group um, with three uh, uh, one person from um, architecture, one from um, design, and one from uh, uh, art. 
and 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 uh, yes, um, it, it, I think this, the statement of our of why we got the prize was that our that we work across different uh, disciplines, but yet not really uh, are uh, we are not at home or like like hundred percent in any of them, but that our art belongs to the future. And me and Martina were joking about that, <laughs> saying that, oh, wow, that feels great that we at least belong somewhere. somewhere. Because we've been, that's really like, I think that's why it's so warming. It's like it's, it puts the words on it. We, we don't really feel we belong anywhere. And yet we maybe belong um, in a lot of different places, but uh, at least to belong in, in the future, it gives us a sense of home. So it's kind of warms. It really warms the heart. I think when you when you're creating and you're constantly creating and creating and then kind of it completes a little bit the cycle to have that sort of uh, acknowledgement back to it. It's, it's important, mm. I think. So.